God. This is your spiritual act of worship. In other words, worship is to be our entire lifestyle. We are to live our whole lives with the view to doing everything we do as unto the Lord. And even though we do live our whole lives with the view to worshiping God, most of us, I think, connect worshiping to church. Now, I've heard more than once somebody say, well, I don't have to go to church to worship God. I can worship God just as well out in the golf course. I have to tell you, I've spent many, many hours on the golf course. <laughs> I've heard the Lord's name mentioned many times. <laughs> I've seen lots of golf balls baptized, and I mean immersed, not sprinkled. <laughs> but what I hear and see on the course is a far cry from worship. And it seems that a number of prominent theologians and pastors today feel that what passes for worship in many churches today falls short of the mark. The late R.C. Sproul puts his finger on the concern, I think, with this observation. He says, regrettably, too many churches today have forgotten the awesome privilege and sacred duty of worship, preferring to create seeker-friendly services that often cater more to our culture and this love of entertainment than to the adoration of our Creator. In the seeker-sensitive model, Worship has become a means to attract the unchurched through the means of marketing with little regard as to whether such a model is proper for worshiping God. So the question is, what is a proper model for worshiping God? Well, we'll not find a more reliable model for authentic worship than in the text that Willie read from Revelation chapter 5, if you would like to turn there in here in your Bibles. Because in that passage, the Lord, through his vision to the Apostle John, John, draws back the curtains of heaven to give us a glimpse of worship that is taking place. And what we have here really in chapter 5 is a case study in worship. A case study is, gets rid of all the independent variables in order to study the very thing itself. In this case, worship. Now, there are many things that might be true of our worship today that are not true of this worship in heaven. Things like the style of music, you know, choruses, hymns, types of instruments, inattention. None of these variables that can complicate and hinder our worship here on earth are present in that worship in heaven. And so with none of the distractions that might be true of our worship today present, what God presents to us through this scene of Revelation chapter 5 is pure worship. And we see by it a number of features that serve as a guide for us to follow in our worship here on earth. And I, I really wish I had more time to go into this text in more detail. It is a fascinating passage of scripture, but we don't. So this morning what I propose to do is put our finger on the central theme of worship and then address two applicants, two, two applications for us. They can make them nervous about them when you <laughs> Our vision of worship <clears throat> begins by directing our attention to a scroll. Verse 1. I saw in the right hand of him who was seated on the throne a scroll with writing on both sides and sealed with seven seals. Notice three features about the scroll. First of all, it has writing on both sides. Scrolls in those days normally had writing only on one side, the inside. But this scroll had writing on both sides, the inside and the outside, indicating that it is full. Second, the scroll is held in the right hand of God who's sitting on the throne. And third, the scroll is sealed with seven seals. In those days, seals could be broken only by the one who had the authority and the ability to enact the contents of the scroll. So the scroll with writing on both sides that God holds in his right hand is a symbolic way of saying, this is God's whole plan for his creation in one place. 
It is the fullness of all the events that fulfill his plan and his purposes and his promises. It contains all of his blessings and all of his judgments. And since the seals could be broken only by one who has the authority or the ability to enact the content of the document, we hear this invitation in verse 2. And I saw a mighty angel proclaiming with a loud voice, Who is worthy to open the scroll and break the seals? Who has the ability to come forward and to take that scroll and to open it, and in so doing has the ability to bring about the fulfillment of all of God's plans and purposes in his universe? His victory over evil, his judgments, his blessings, his kingdom, his plans and purposes for you and I. Who is worthy? And all of a sudden, a silence descends over the whole throne. Everything stops. The suspense builds as the future of mankind and the entire universe awaits for someone who is capable of taking that scroll and breaking the seals and enacting all of God's plans and purposes for human history. And as we read in verse 3, no one is worthy. Even though they are sinless and have great power, not the mightiest of angels. They have power, but they're not worthy to take the scroll and slit the seals. And even though they have served God well, not the greatest apostle is able to come forward and take the scroll and open the seals. Nor anyone else in all of God's creation is able to come forward and to break the seals and to bring all of God's plans to fruition. And so we read in verse 4 that John weeps. He's weeping at the despair of the world without a heavenly advocate. He's devastated because without anyone who's able to come forward and enact all of God's plans and all of his purposes, everything is lost. Events are just blind fate. Satan wins. All the struggles of the Christians are in vain and all our hope for eternal life is lost. Every injustice goes unavenged. Life's unfairness wins. <clears throat> and so his tears should be our tears, shouldn't they? When we realize that without divine intervention, or without divine guidance, our lives are just a series of events driven by chance and fate, with no purpose, no meaning. We have no hope for the future. Things are always going to be the way they are right now. But wait. One of the elders consoles John in verse 5 and said, Weep no more. There is someone who is worthy to come and open the scroll. Behold, the lion of the tribe of Judah, the root of David, has conquered so that he can open the seals, the, the, the scroll and its seven seals. The elder links the one who is able to come forward and take the scroll with Old Testament prophecies. He's a lion of Judah, mentioned in Genesis 49. He's the root of David, named in Isaiah's prophecy in Isaiah 11.1. 1. Both of these references, of course, are speaking of the promised Messiah. He is the one who has conquered. So he is worthy to open the scroll and enact all of God's plans for his universe. So upon hearing this, when John looks up to see the victorious conqueror, he expects to see someone in keeping with the image of a lion, someone powerful, someone mighty, someone victorious, majestic. And he looks up and he sees not a lion, but a lamb. Verse 6. Then I saw a lamb looking as if it had been slain, standing in the center of the throne, encircled by the four living creatures and the elders. Now to be clear, the lion and the lamb are the same person. And it's not even a healthy young lamb. It's a lamb looking as though it had been slain. And even though it had been slain, it's still standing. It's alive. And as you read, the Lamb steps forward and he takes the scroll from God's right hand. And all heaven bursts into worship <coughs> and praise of the Lamb who was slain. 
And they sang a new song, saying, Worthy are you to take the scroll to open the seals, for you were slain. And by your blood you purchased men from God, for God from every tribe and language and nation. And then down in verse 12, Worthy is the Lamb who was slain to receive power and wealth and wisdom and might and honor and glory and blessing. Now if you notice in verse 9 that this song that the four living creatures and the 24 elders sang was a new song. We didn't look at the old song. It was in Revelation chapter 4 verse 11 which goes, You are worthy, our Lord and our God, to receive glory and honor and power. For, here's why, you created all things. By your will they were created and have their being. That was the old song. It focused on God's creation. But here in Revelation chapter 5, the four living creatures and the elders break into a new song. And the focus of this new song, this worship, is the death of Jesus. Not his teaching, not his compassion, not his power, not his miracles, but his death on the cross. So, if the shedding of Jesus' blood on the cross is a focus on worship in heaven, how much less should it be the main focus of our worship here on earth? We focus our worship on the cross because Christ's death is a monumental event. A monumental event in all of human history. And to put that statement into perspective, we need to go back to from, from the tree on Calvary to the tree in the garden in Genesis chapter 3. Because if we don't understand what took place in the garden, we'll never fully grasp what took a place on the cross. Genesis chapter 3 is one of the most critical chapters in the entire Bible. Because here in Genesis chapter 3, we find out how Adam and Eve's actions shape the course of human history. Why the world is today, the, the way it is today. Why you and I are the way we are today. And why the crucifixion and the bodily erection of Jesus is the most monumental event in all of human history. Genesis chapter 3 records the fall of man. God created Adam in his, in God's own image. Adam enjoyed a close love relationship with God. God told Adam that he had the freedom to eat from any tree in the garden, any tree, except that one. And if you eat from that tree, Adam, you will surely die. Well, you know the story. Adam used his free will to disobey God and chose to do what he thought was best for him rather than what God said was best for him. And that's the lure of, of, of sin, isn't it? That's, that, that's what sin is. And that's the lure of sin. What I want will make me happier than what God wants. That's the attraction of sin. So Adam's sin was both a crime and a defeat. It was a crime because he broke God's command and was subject to punishment. That punishment was, was separation, separation from God, which the Bible calls spiritual death. And to make things right with God, a punishment must be paid. The punishment of death. But Adam's sin wasn't just a crime, it was also a defeat in that it put him under Satan's power of sin and death over life. And so Adam's defeat means that he needed deliverance from Satan's control. Now what in the world does what Adam did in the garden matter to us thousands and thousands of years later? What difference does it make? Well, here's why. Adam is a federal head of mankind. And as such, he acted on behalf of all humanity. Just as our Prime Minister, as our federal head, acts on behalf of all of Canada. And so Adam's sin caused all mankind to fall. And as Romans 
3.23 announces, We all have sinned, all of us, and fall short of the glory of God. And therefore, as Romans 6.23 says, the wage of sin is death for all of us. We all need to make things right with God by paying the death penalty. And likewise, because of Adam's disobedience, as John points out in 1 John 5, 9, 19, we're under Satan's power over all humanity. Where he says in uh, 1 John 5, 19, we know that we are the children of God and that the whole world is under control of the evil one. So each of us needs to be delivered from the power and from the control of Satan in our lives. And here's a problem. Since we're born spiritually dead, and as people who live under control of the evil one, we are powerless to restore our relationship with God and to break free from Satan's control over us. We're like Humpty Dumpty off at a great fall. And nothing can put us back together. And I always thought that'd be a great name for church. The Church of the Humpty Dumpty. <laughs> <laughs> the world is under Satan's control. The world says man is gradually getting better. That, that man started down here and is working his way up here. But the message of the Bible is no. Man started up here, he fell down here, and he stuck down here. There's nothing he can do to get himself out of down there. He is held captive by his bondage to sin. And there's nothing we can do to restore our relationship with God. And there's nothing we can do to break free from Satan to grip over us. Uh, but here's the good news that brings us back to the Lamb who was slain, yet standing. God promised that he would overcome Satan's dominion over us. And in Genesis chapter 3, 15, he put Satan on notice. He said there would be enmity, enmity between the serpent, Satan, and the woman, and one of her descendants, a prophetic reference to Jesus, would smash the serpent's head. And that final decisive battle that began at the tree in the garden was fought and won by Jesus on the tree at Calvary. <coughs> For it's on the cross where Jesus defeated Satan, stripping him of his power over mankind and taking away for us the sting of death. Here's how. Just as the first Adam acted on behalf of all humanity, so Jesus was the second Adam in that he was able to act on all on behalf of all humanity. And acting in our behalf as our representative, Jesus took his place on the cross instead of us. And when he was on the cross, God placed your sin and my sin and the sin of the whole world upon him. And he paid the penalty for our sin by dying in our place. And just before giving up his spirit on the cross, Jesus cried, It is finished. Tell us die. His victory was total. His victory was final. And his victory is available to anyone who places their trust in his person and his work on their behalf. Every tribe and language and people and nation. So we focus our worship on the cross because Jesus' self-sacrificed death is a monumental event in all human history. Because it defeated Satan's dominion over mankind. It freed us from the penalty and the power of sin. It made possible the restoration of our love relationship with God. And it made Jesus the only one who was able and worthy to enact all of God's plans and purposes for humanity. Yeah. But there's more. We also focus our worship on the cross to continually remind us that Christ's death always gives us a right standing before God. For you see, another transfer took place when the Lamb of God was on the cross. Not only were our sins transferred to Him, and He paid the penalty for our sin in our place, but His righteousness was transferred from Him 
to all who put their faith in him. So that whenever God looks upon us, he doesn't see us. He sees the righteousness of Christ. That's Paul's very point in 2 Corinthians 5.22, 5.21. Him who knew no sin to be sin on our behalf, so that he might become the righteousness of God in him. You see, even though sin is no longer our master, as long as we travel with this side, this side of heaven, we're still in perfect. We mess up. And we come into the worship service each week as people who have not gotten things right during that week. Maybe you've lost your temper. You said something that hurt somebody. You've been nurturing an unforgiving spirit. You mistreated your spouse. You failed to be the person that you wanted to be in that situation. Now our enemy isn't called the accuser for nothing. He loves to come and kind of perch on your shoulder and whisper in your ear, oh, you messed up again. You call yourself a Christian after doing that? Come on. You don't think God will ever forgive you for that, do you? Boy, did you ever screw that up. You're a failure. You're worthless. Guilt, condemnation, unforgiveness. So when we come to worship on Sunday morning, we need to focus on the cross of Jesus so that we remember that not only were our sins imputed to him, that just makes us not guilty, but his righteousness was imputed to us. So when God looks at us, he sees not our sin, but Christ's righteousness. And your righteousness is the same yesterday, today, and forever. It doesn't get better when your faith is strong. It doesn't get worse when your faith is weak. It's perfect all the time because it's Christ's righteousness that you clothe with it. So in those times when your enemy would try to bring you down, focus on the cross and say to Satan, liar, liar, pants on fire. Here's who I am in Christ. I'm loved. I'm accepted. I'm a child of the King. I'm a joint heir with Jesus. I am forgiven. I'm free from condemnation. I'm free from the law of sin or death. I am a temple of the Holy Spirit. I am a new creation in Christ. I am redeemed by the blood of the Lamb. I want to leave you with these words from that song, Lamb Upon the Throne, because I think it captures the essence of this morning's message. All heaven declares the glory of the risen Lord. Who can compare with the beauty of the Lord? Forever he will be the Lamb upon the throne. I gladly bow the knee and worship him alone. I will proclaim the glory of the risen Lord, who, was, who once was slain to reconcile man to God. Forever you will be the Lamb on the throne. I will gladly bow my knee and worship him alone. Amen. Father, will never ever this side of heaven be able to thank you for what you have done for us through our Lord Jesus Christ the Lamb of God who was slain from the foundation of the world so Lord with all the sincerity we can muster from our hearts we simply say thank you thank you thank you and by your spirit enable us to live in the fullness of the joy of the salvation that you have given to us. We ask this in Christ's name. Amen. Amen.